Hello there, and welcome to the Audio Epics podcast, about to premiere the fifth episode already of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay, with the chapters The Statuette and The Crown. We are so grateful for your enthusiastic comments about the story so far. And, of course, there's much more to come. After this episode, seven more, in fact. Meanwhile, we'd love to welcome the following new patrons. Tony Ranico and Liam Gabriel, two grand generals. Lady Hoskiv may start thinking about her retirement with these guys watching over Seven Peaks. We now have 20 patrons. If you'd like to join our Patreon community, check out our page on patreon.com slash audioepics. Whether you can only spare $1 a month or more, it's all good. It's a tremendous help for us to keep creating these fantasy stories, and you, in return, may enjoy the many rewards there, like exclusive content, updates and merchandise. And, of course, from the Witch Hunter Master tier on, you can enjoy the extended edition of the Treasure of Boneyard Bay, which is 50 minutes longer, almost an hour of extra scenes. Thank you all for liking, commenting and sharing, for reviewing and purchasing our stories in whichever way or form you prefer, and of course, don't forget to subscribe and get notified of new content. Now, hop on board of the Theresia with Captain Brokelhoff, Master von Baumeister, the Initiates and the Witch Hunters, and dive into this fifth episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay. The Statuette It was midnight when they arrived at Boneyard Bay. Uncountable multitudes of stars twinkled in the nightly firmament, with a massive full moon shining like a pale lantern in their midst. The witch hunters and initiates were all standing on deck, along with Gustav and the priestess. Everyone was looking forward to their first glimpse of the infamous town which shared its name with the massive bay in which it was nestled. So far they had seen nothing but a thin beach of white sand that appeared bluish silver in the moonlight, and beyond it a dark mass of jungle-covered hills. The Teresia glided along in the calm waters, slowly but surely nearing her destination. At last the ship arrived at a quay where it was anchored, The town of Boneyard Bay was only visible as a nest of flickering lights in the distance. There was no one to greet them, nor anything like a toll to be paid, only a long strip of beach leading to the town at the end of the bay. To their left were the eerie sounds of the jungle at night, and to the right the soothing lapping of the waves. The scent in the air was a refreshing blend of the smells of varied plants and flowers with the cool aroma of the sea. It felt a little strange to be walking on solid ground again, especially across the loose sand. The experience was somewhat like trying to walk in a straight line while drunk. Rudlov was striding alongside Fedehel and Alvarado in the direction of the twinkling lights of the town. The initiates were at the head of the column, von Baumeister and the other witch hunters right behind them, and finally Gustav and the priestess closed the ranks. None of the Theresia's crew had come with them on this first encounter with the town. The soil of my homeland, Alvarado said wistfully as he looked at his feet. Have you ever been to Boneyard Bay before? Fedehel asked. No, the Esclavian admitted. My experience is mostly limited to the eastern side of Esclavia. I hear bad things of these parts, to be honest. I hear it's a haven for pirates and other villains, Federhel said, provoking nothing more than a shrug from Alvarado. Where there is talk of treasure, there will be talk of pirates, Ludlov commented. I don't know if we should take those rumors too seriously. I suspect most of them will simply be smugglers and petty thieves with a passing curiosity for treasure. Not cutthroats and marauders. Gustav has been here before. Chappelle said from behind them, causing the three men to turn their heads. You could ask him? Although von Baumeister's expression was hidden beneath the brim of his hat, 
The initiates could tell by the man's body language that it would not be in their best interest to show too much friendship to the Flatlander for the moment. Ludlow felt a bit sorry for Gustav, who had become something of an outcast ever since the confrontation had occurred. We'll soon see Barnyard Bay for ourselves. Perhaps we shouldn't spoil the surprise, Federhel said diplomatically. The entrance to Boneyard Bay was a giant wooden gate that looked like it had been hastily constructed out of wreckage and leftover bits of timber at least a century ago. Walking through it was an experience unlike any other. When Ludlow had set foot in Boinvue, he had felt like a traveler in a distant land. Here, it was more like entering another world altogether. The entire town was constructed out of shipwrecks. There were ships lying on their side, half buried in the sand, with the hull serving as a roof and the deck as the front wall. Others stood straight up with the bow at the top, looking almost like the tall, narrow, pointed buildings of Seven Peaks. He even saw three ships piled on top of each other, as if a creature more enormous than Tubalba had simply picked them up and stacked them there. People made their way to and fro using boardwalks, simple bridges of rope and planks, and even by climbing along ship shrouds. The whole place bathed in a clash of green and orange light as there were lanterns everywhere, some with colored glass, others without. Despite the town's makeshift and apparently chaotic nature, the people of Boneyard Bay had protected their wooden abodes well against the dangers of fire. There was not a single naked flame in sight, but there was smoke rising from unseen places, rich with the scents of herbs, fish and meat. Despite the late hour, Boneyard Bay was teeming with activity. In particular, every form of feasting and entertainment in existence. The people walking, dancing or drunkenly stumbling through the town were from every part of the known world. But most were dressed like sailors who wouldn't stay in this place for long. Beyond the glow of the town, Ludlow could just make out the shadows of the tall cliffs that surrounded Boneyard Bay, looking out over the sea. Alvarado took a deep breath. Just smell it! He cried out enthusiastically. I have a feeling my herb collection is about to be expanded. I'm sure it is, Ludlow said, still trying to take in the dizzying sight of the town. As they made their way between the buildings, they encountered one surprise after another. They saw a man swinging on a rope from one ship to another like a pirate. A gypsy family dancing to a jig around a fire made entirely of a pile of lanterns. And a giant, gold-lacquered figurehead shaped like a dragon as the centerpiece of a square. The statue was surrounded by hundreds of candles in glass jars, almost as if it were an object of religious reverence. Dragon Plaza, Gustav said. Is that its name? Federhel asked. Yes, Initiate. I'm quite familiar with this place. That way lies the food market, said the Flatlander, pointing at a street heading in the direction of the cliffs. You will mostly find fresh ingredients for cooking and such over there. And over there is the beach, which is where the trinkets are sold. And that's the part of interest to us. You can also find something to eat over there. Well, almost anything really, as long as it comes from the sea. Gustav and Alvarado both looked very excited to be in this place, while most of the others just seemed bewildered by their surroundings. Von Baumeister said, Spread out and explore the town. If you learn anything of value, report it to me in the morning. Will we spend the night here or on the Theresia? Ludlow asked. I want to spend as little money as possible in this den of vice. We will sleep on the ship. Von Baumeister took Turmgard with him down the streets into the heart of the town, while Ludlow, 
Alvarado and Gustav went in the direction of the beach. Chappelle and Federhel made their way towards a rickety wooden staircase that would lead them to the higher levels of the town. Like always, Gustav went ahead at a very confident pace. Ludlov and Alvarado could tell the Flatlander knew Boneyard Bay rather well. They passed through a tunnel consisting of the frame of a large ship covered by a black leather sail. Figureheads from various vessels were lined up on either side. Most were in the shape of beautiful female characters, including some mermaids, but there were also a few less attractive ones, depicting fierce animals and even a human skeleton. When they emerged out of the tunnel, they were on the town beach, which was many times wider than the narrow strip of sand on which they had walked from the Tuesia. Here, fire was clearly allowed, as quite a few little campfires dotted the sand. There was a clash of smells in the air, but most of them were delicious. Alvarado held up his nose and sniffed excitedly, sounding like a dog on a trail. I want to remember everything, he said when Ludlow shot a look of mock concern at him. As they continued their walk along the beach, Ludlow saw that some of the people around the campfires were holding sticks with strange-looking fish and squid tentacles, roasting them. They passed several stalls where food and drinks were served. But there were also tattoo artists, prostitutes and even fortune tellers plying their trades. Ludlov knew there was nothing he could do about the latter so far from Evenendale, but he had to suppress an urge to walk up to them and warn them of the dangers of forbidden magic. Alvarado held still and gasped when they arrived at one of the largest stalls on the beach, owned by a heavyset woman with huge earrings and dark curly hair that exploded out from under a colorful bandana. Behind her back were five wide shelves, full of herbs, oils and spices. At that moment, Ludlov knew it would be useless to wait for the Esclavian to finish his browsing. Gustav had already disappeared into the crowd farther on, and Ludlov decided to try and find him. To his surprise, he soon found the Flatlander coming back towards him. He was holding a metal statuette in his hand, depicting a woman in a long flowing robe. Another priceless artifact? Ludlov asked. Quite the contrary, Initiate, Gustav said. This is a worthless piece of amateur craftsmanship. I managed to haggle it down quite a bit, but the price was still too steep, if you ask me. Then why did you buy it? Just to illustrate the point, but Master von Baumeister would have to be present. I hope he will listen, Ludlov said. Gustav shrugged. If he doesn't, it's his loss. He wants to find the treasure, doesn't he? Then he should pay attention. Ludlov smiled. He admired the way Gustav was able to shrug off the hatred and threats that came his way, without even expressing any hostile emotions to von Baumeister. I just be careful around him, Ludlov warned. I appreciate your concern, Ludlov. Let's return to the ship and I'll give you all a little presentation in the morning. The sun was still hidden behind the tall cliffs when the companions were gathered on the deck of the Teresia in the grey morning light. Some were standing, others leaning against a mast or sitting on a barrel. Ludlov stood at the railing with his back to the sea. The time has come to lay out our plans for finding the treasure of Boneyard Bay, said Master von Baumeister loudly. The shopkeeper's single contribution to this endeavor may be divulged now, he continued, at least keeping the sneer in his tone to a minimum. Show us your trinket, Finster Dunkel. Gustav hopped off his enormous backpack, which he had dragged on deck, and used for a chair. He rummaged around in it and finally took out the same metal statuette Ludlow had seen the night before. With a dramatic flourish, the Flatlander held it up for all to see. This is a statuette of Sintrasha, the sorcerer queen of Oskorta. Supposedly, it is the one and only key to the treasure of Boneyard Bay. How can that be? Ludlow said. I saw you buy it from a market stall on the beach last night. Exactly! 
Gustav pointed at Ludlov as if he had just made a brilliant contribution to his lesson. This is not the key. It's a useless piece of junk. Not even very well made, if you ask me. The man who sells them has swindled me and many other adventurers countless times. You see, rumor has it that the key is indeed a statuette of Sintrasha. But this is not it. Alvarado seemed amused by the Flatlander. Chapelle and Federhel both displayed more of a puzzled expression, and Turmgard just looked annoyed. Both von Baumeister and Blessed Zelenheim remained impassive. The man who sells these is a petty crook. He never even recognizes me when I return to his stall, and I've been there quite a few times. He's so blinded by his greed, he doesn't pay attention to people. He paused for dramatic effect. Everyone was quiet. Only the sounds of the sea and the jungle continued undisturbed. But of course, the story doesn't end here. You see, the last time I was here in Boneyard Bay, I visited his stall and actually bought the real statuette of Queen Sintrasha. The crook didn't realize it, of course. I actually managed to get it for less money than this one because he was having trouble getting rid of his stock. He grinned at the memory. The others exchanged worried looks. Doubt me, do you? Gustav said confidently. Allow me to show you then. He passed the statuette on to Federhel, who happened to be closest to him. Notice the hands, folded in prayer. That's common in most of these fake statuettes that were made in recent days. Most people tend to think of Sintrasha as something of a saint, and so they depict her in a typically saintly position. However, the real statuette looks like this. He bent over and started rummaging in his backpack again, finally pulling out another statuette. It looked older and a bit more worn than the one he had just shown, but it seemed to have sapphires for eyes. As you can see, Sintrasha has her left hand on her heart, while her right is pointing downward. It's a sign of warning. Wait, interjected Turmgard. Are you saying that ugly old thing is the actual key to the treasure? Of course I am, pay attention. Now, look here. Gustav held up the worn statuette. I suppose the sparkly eyes are nice, Turmgard mumbled. As you can see, this one has a base shaped like a five-pointed star. I believe that the base is the actual key. All we have to do is find the star-shaped slot, turn the key, and then we can return to Seven Peaks as happy heroes. I don't know if this is relevant, but when we were exploring the town last night, we found a full-scale statue of Queen Sintrasha, Chapelle said. Where did you see it? asked von Baumeister, who had been unusually quiet throughout Gustav's demonstration. Higher up, just outside the borders of the town. There is a stairway carved into the cliffs. We went up there to the top and there it was. Curiously though, the statue on the cliffs wasn't pointing downward, but in the direction of the sea, Federhel added. Well spotted, said Gustav. I think that statue is supposed to ward off the evil of cursed objects that are often brought here by pirates and other scum. How did you know it was Sintrasha? She was depicted with a hairband with a five-pointed star in the middle, Federhel replied. That was the mark of royalty in Oskota. Could the statue have something to do with the treasure? Chappelle wondered. Or was it made after the rumors began that Sintrasha had left her treasure here? Even Federhel couldn't answer that question. Perhaps it could be the location of the treasure itself, Ludlov suggested. Who knows, but we didn't see any keyholes where Gustav's statuette would fit, Alvarado replied with a shrug. No, 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 Gustav said, waving his hand dismissively. It's never going to be that simple. There should be a clue around here, yes, but the location where the key actually fits will be hidden, I'm sure. Otherwise, the treasure would have been found long ago. Fortunately... I believe Master von Baumeister can help us here. Pray, Master Witch Hunter, illuminate us with your wisdom. Ludlov winced. He assumed Gustav was honestly trying to compensate for his earlier disrespect, but it could come across as mocking irony. Luckily, von Baumeister ignored the Flatlander's tone and addressed them all very seriously. While Mr. Finsterdunkel holds the key to the treasure, I am in possession of the roadmap towards it. 
Then he opened his coat and took a small book from his breast pocket. This notebook comes from the Carmina, a ship that met a tragic end 20 years ago on the east coast of Esclavia, about a hundred miles south of Manosa. The ship sailed right into some sharp rocks and got permanently stuck. None of the crew survived, and in the years that followed, the Carmina was cleared and everything of value was sold in places like Boneyard Bay. As you might expect, this precious notebook has had lots of owners. He looked at the small volume with a curious expression, before continuing his explanation. It was bound in black leather and didn't have any lettering or ornament on the cover. Eventually, the book came into the hands of our Lord Adomir, who paid a high price for it. Since this book contains some occult symbols and descriptions of superstitious habits, Lord Adamir purchased it with the permission of the Witch Hunter Order for research purposes. It's been hiding in plain sight, right in our very own library for many years, until Mr. Finsterdunkel mentioned the treasure in public, and Lord Adamir remembered its contents. Looking at the small black book, Ludloff thought of the vast library of the Witch Hunter Order, and how inconspicuous such a nondescript volume would be in the middle of such an endless repository of knowledge. The book contains a description of the supposed contents of the treasure, which is believed to consist not just of Sintrasha's wealth, but also Novaculus, which she had held on to despite her conversion. There will be lots of gold, but also gemstones and, of course, jewellery. Gustav's eyes glistened with a spark of excitement at the description. And finally, there will be several documents in there of great historical value, such as journals and reports that can tell us more about the history of the Oscortans. Now it was Federhel's turn to look excited. Of course, the precise contents are unknown to us, but according to this journal, the value of this treasure is estimated to rival the personal fortune of the King of Esclavia. Alvarado whistled. Ludlov remembered he had spent some time in the royal palace of Manosa and would have some idea of the king's wealth. This hoard will be enough to restore our beloved city to her former greatness, von Baumeister said. Widows and orphans will be fed, crime will be fought and trade with Parslavena will flourish once more. As for our share as treasure hunters, we will receive the greatest part of all, the honor and gratitude of the people of Seven Peaks. If we make it back, of course. His words were followed by a tense silence, during which he regarded them all sternly. The true peril of our journey lies ahead of us now, and if at the end we do find the treasure, it may be cursed. There are always such rumors surrounding ancient treasures, and in some cases they turn out to be true. This is where Blessed Zelenheim will prove vital to our mission. Only she will be able to lift such a curse. The priestess bowed her head solemnly. Blessed, I am happy to have you with us, Alvarado said. But I wonder, why would the treasure be cursed if Queen Sintrasha herself hid it? Didn't she renounce such things? In fact, I seem to remember there was one stock of canonizing her as a saint. There was, but it never materialized, Federhel said. Not enough details were known about her life. She did claim she had left behind her old ways, von Baumeister conceded, but how can we know the truth? Besides, if Novaculous possessions are there as well, we should be especially vigilant. Ludlov considered that for a moment, and found himself agreeing with von Baumeister. We should also think of the supposed intentions of Queen St. Russia, Blessed Zelenheim said. From our former discussions about the treasure, if I may say, Master von Baumeister, I came to understand that she devised a challenge so that only the worthy could find it. What does she mean by worthy, though? Tomgard said. Clever? Virtuous? Or just Sintra? That is indeed our guess, said von Baumeister, as the treasure would have been found long ago if it was just a matter of knowing where to look. We think it's rather a question of knowing where to start and, of course, of owning the key to unlock it. Then we should begin by wondering why she decided to hide the treasure here in Boneyard Bay, Ludlow concluded. Finally, a question worth asking, said von Baumeister. And the answer, of course, is in here.
He tapped the little black book assuredly. It seems the captain of the Carmina was a treasure hunter himself. Whether he was simply an adventurer or more of a pirate is less clear and ultimately immaterial to us. The journal mentions several times that there have been legends and stories of a great treasure somewhere in the vicinity of Boneyard Bay for so long that the facts have been mingled with fairy tales and even jokes. The writer of this journal believed that Boneyard Bay itself is not the location of the treasure, but simply the starting point of the journey. Oh dear, and here I thought we were nearing the end, said the priestess with a sigh. We have reached an end, blessed, the master said. The end of our journey through the civilized world is here. Now begins the journey into the wild and untamed places. If Boneyard Bay is the beginning of that, how do we know where to go now? Chappelle asked. Is that in the journal too? Indeed it is, or so its author claims, von Baumeister said. He was terribly vague about it though. He obviously didn't want anyone else to get a hold of this journal and find out how to find the treasure. He flipped through the pages until he found what he was looking for. Then he turned the book over for all to see. Ludlov didn't know what to think when he saw what was on the page. It looked like a crude drawing of a very tall crown with five spikes. The bottom of the crown was rounded, and in the middle of it was a cross, or perhaps the letter X. From Boneyard Bay sail to... dot 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 were the only words on the page, written right above the drawing. That is vague indeed, Federhel muttered. A crown? Does that symbolize the treasure itself? Chappelle wondered aloud. If so, then this is useless. No, oh, there is an X, Tomgard said. That always means the location of a treasure. If so, then the treasure is at the bottom of this crown, Alvarado mused. Gustav shook his head in exasperation. I thought you knew something about herbs and plants, Initiate. <laughs> Alvarado gasped. Of course! It's a strand krona leaf! I should have seen that! <laughs> Thank you, Gusta! What strand krona? Some kind of local plant? Tomgard asked. It is not local, Alvarado pointed out. It mostly grows on the archipelago of Garadoso, and on the southern coast around the gate of Linia. The gardens of Marnosa had them as well, but you wouldn't find them growing naturally in Esclavia. Perhaps it means we have to travel to one of those places where it does grow, Ludlov suggested. An interesting idea, Initiate. But then why would the journal say we have to sail from Boneyard Bay? Master von Baumeister said. And as Alvarado pointed out, there are many places where this plant could be found. Chappelle, who had been walking down the deck, suddenly turned towards the group and snapped her fingers. You are right, Master. We have to sail from Boneyard Bay, she exclaimed. And these five-pointed crown is our destination. That means the crown must be something that can be reached by ship. What crown can be found in the sea? The crown of Kulmaron, Federhel replied. Of course, Ludlov said. That must be it. The others were enthused as well. The crown of Kulmaron was a circle of five pointed rocks in the ocean west of Isclavia. In ancient days, the inhabitants of Isclavia came there to bear offerings to Kulmaron, the sea god. Over the centuries, the sea level had risen and the crown had sunken almost entirely beneath the waves. Unfortunately, we don't have any specific coordinates, Federhel said. We don't even know if it's still there anymore. The excitement among the group cooled down as quickly as it had fanned up. Well, at least we know this. It has to be somewhere out of the way, or some unfortunate ship would have crashed onto it in all of that time, Gustav commented. There should be some old book or map that can show us where to find it, Federhel said. But I don't think we're going to find something like that in Boneyard Bay, and I don't think there's anyone who will simply point the way either. Yes, there is. Chappelle suddenly exclaimed, even more excited than before now. Everyone turned to the Goldorian witch hunter. We have already found someone to point us the way, she said with a smile. Queen Saint Russia herself. She may have been pointing the way all this time from the top of that cliff.
crown. The statue was larger than Ludlow had expected. It stood on a rock on the highest part of the cliff, overlooking the bay far below. Only the master, Federhel, Chapelle and Ludlow had climbed the staircase up the cliff. The others had remained on board the Theresia, or went to the town itself to buy supplies for the coming adventure. The day had grown hot and sweaty, with not a single cloud in sight, nor the slightest hint of a breeze. Ludlow was thirsty and uncomfortable, feeling his shirt stick to his body with sweat. Up here, the only sound came from crickets hidden in the tall grass that haphazardly stuck out between the rocks, accompanied by the gentle rushing of the waves far below. Queen Sintrasha made a powerful, regal figure. She stood pointing in the distance like an intrepid explorer, bearing an expression of determination and focused will. The sculptor had made her robes and hair flow as if caught in a breeze. It made for a dramatic scene. She is holding her hand towards the open sea, Ludlow said. She could be casting a spell, warding off evil, or pointing the way somewhere. I agree, Chapelle said. This depiction of Queen Sintrasha could be meant to point the worthy finders in the direction of her treasure. I believe you may be right, Chapelle, von Baumeister concluded, as he inspected the statue up close. We will at least be making the attempt to seek the treasure in that direction. The statue's pointing west and slightly south, said Federhel, holding a compass. We should head out of the bay and sail in that direction. Following a direct line from the Queen's arm should get us to the crown of Kulmaron, if Chapelle's interpretation is right. Then he took off his backpack and took out a ledger and some writing utensils. And what awaits us there? Ludlow wondered aloud. How could the treasure be hidden in the crown? I pray the Flatlander's statuette key pays off. Von Baumeister said. I imagine there is some kind of lock hidden in those rocks. Rocks that have been mostly submerged for centuries, Chapelle said in a worried voice. Federhel was kneeling by the statue now, making notes on a map that folded out of his ledger. Strange, he noted. There are some niches in the base here, all around the statue, five of them. And in each of these niches, there's a metal spike. Like, you know, like we used to stick candles on. I don't know which metal this is, but it's resisted rust and wear for all these years. Ludlow knelt beside Federhel to inspect one of the niches and the conical spike inside. It was rather thick. Perhaps they were actually once used to stick candles on, but they would have to have been rather big candles. As for the material, it might be grey metal. An ore that could only be mined in the mountain range of the White Towers, where the Dugarim dwelled, grey metal had a reputation for being extremely durable, and it never rusted. Well, I don't think Finsterdunkel's key would fit in any of those, von Baumeister said at a cursory glance. I suggest we stay focused on finding the crown of Kulmaron, and if we succeed at that, there will still be the difficulty of opening the lock underwater and getting that heavy chest to the surface somehow. I might be able to open the lock, Federhel said without looking up. I'm a good swimmer. I grew up in a fishing village, remember? By the river, Chapelle remarked. I spent my youth swimming in the northern sea itself on the coast of Luanbu. I have jumped into the waves from cliffs almost as tall as this one. Boasting doesn't become you, Chapelle, Ludlow said with a smile, provoking a blush from her. Well, at least we won't lack volunteers, von Baumeister said pragmatically. I hope we won't need more than one. Despite the heat, Ludlow felt a shiver as the implications of the witch hunter master's words sunk in. Ignoring the conversation, Federhel took out a ruler and drew a line across the map. Well, this should provide the captain with the information he needs to set sail, he said, looking up. They all looked at each other, and for the first time since their encounter with Tuvalbar, Ludlow was reminded of the very real possibility that not everyone would survive the search for the treasure of Boneyard Bay.
When they arrived at the ship, they found Captain Brökelhoff on deck in the middle of an argument with Gustav. The Teresia has suffered more than enough damage on this trip already, they heard the captain say. Now you want us to sail straight towards a hidden formation of sharp, spiky rocks? Gustav shrugged. Don't worry, he said. Von Baumeister hastened up the gangplank and approached the captain. Please don't be deterred by the Flatlander's reassurances, Captain, he said. The truth is that the Crown of Kulmaron has always been the destination of this entire endeavor. We just didn't know it yet. Welcome back aboard, Master von Baumeister, said the Captain. And while I believe you are right, <laughs> that does not diminish the peril. For centuries, seafarers have done all in their power to stay as far away from the Crown as possible. And now you intend to sail directly towards it. I'm sure you will understand my hesitation. Drowning at sea is not a pleasant experience from what I hear. Not to mention that the Isle of Torkusan is not far from the place you want me to steer the Teresia. And I need not explain that it's always better to stay away from the main nest of the Pirate Lord. According to the map, Torgusan is further north than the Crown, Gustav interjected. And as far as the Crown is concerned, the Teresia can stay at a safe distance, you know. You don't have to sail right up to it. We'll row there in a rowboat as soon as we find out its exact location. I already assumed that, Mr. Finsterdunkel, said the captain through gritted teeth. The problem is that the crown is not always visible. The last I heard was that the spikes stick out of the water from time to time depending on the tide, and that's all anyone can see from a distance, if they're lucky. Then we will be slow and careful, said von Baumeister, and we'll be on the lookout, all of us. Captain Brökelhoff sighed and gave each of them a wary look. I did promise to bring you to your destination. I suppose I cannot go back on that now. And they were able to improve the crow's nest when they fixed it in Bois Vue. Ah, maiden have mercy on our souls, I'll do it. But not before the priestess blesses every part of the Teresia. Blessed Zelenheim spent quite some time on the task set before her by the captain, but she performed her duties with solemn dedication. It was late afternoon when the Teresia was ready to leave Boneyard Bay once more and set off into the southern sea, towards the unknown waters of the west. For the remainder of the day, their journey was uneventful. By evening, the coast of Esclavia was out of sight and the sea stretched out into the horizon on all sides. Ludlov was lying in his hammock, looking up at the wooden beams above him by the light of a single candle in a lantern dangling from the ceiling. Tomorrow morning we will be out in the unknown the captain had explained at the dinner table. We will have to be extremely careful then. None of us seem to have any idea precisely how far the crown of Kulmaron is. We only know in which direction it lies, if Mr. Federhelf's calculations prove correct. The captain had been unusually stern and quiet. There hadn't been a trace left of the bon vivant who had sent out Chapelle to order wine in Loin Vue. It was clear to Ludlov that Captain Brokelhoff was deeply worried about his beloved Theresia incurring even more damage after the close encounter with Tubalba. Having lost the real Theresia, this vessel was now the captain's spouse and he would not let any harm come to her. Ludlov could understand that sentiment. He thought of his own beloved wife and how he had always been able to fall asleep right away as long as he could rest his head against her warm body. He was starting to understand the captain in another respect as well, as he was growing accustomed to the ocean rocking him to sleep. He closed his eyes and soon his mind began to conjure up strange images. He saw Maria, dressed in a white gown, covered with silver sequins, wearing a tall crown, much like how he imagined Kulmarons, 
rocking him in her arms like an infant, singing him to sleep. Her arms turned into soft, giant waves, and he could see gulls flying far above the spikes of her crown. The waves roared like a crowd of thousands, but the sound was peaceful and reassuring, and made him feel far removed from all worldly concerns. With his last semi-conscious thought, Ludlov wondered if he was really hearing those roaring waves, or if it was just his imagination. Then he drifted off. Ludlov was stirred out of his sleep by a hand grabbing his shoulder and shaking it. He refused to believe that it was already morning and tried to ignore the intruder, but the hand kept tugging at him relentlessly. Some part of his mind that was not yet fully awake was hoping to see Maria's face, so he eventually opened his eyes, only to be met with the coarse features of a stubbly, small-eyed man with hair that looked like it had just withstood a hurricane. Gustav was smiling at him. Good morning, sunshine! Ludlow was half expecting the flatlander to lick his face like a dog and swatted him away. He felt like an old man when he got up. Looking through the porthole, he saw a sky of pink and grey and concluded it had to be just after sunrise. Am I late? No, I'm just early, Gustav said. That's not the way this usually goes, Ludlov said with a wary frown as he grabbed his weaponry and put on his belt. Are you anxious to see the crown? Finding the crown means finding the treasure, Ludlov. Don't you see? Ludlov smiled at the adventurous shopkeeper. For all his faults, he could only admire the man's spirit. Do you really believe that, Gustav? Of course I do, came the answer firmly. Do you have any doubts then? I am quite convinced that we're looking in the right place, that is, that Sintrasha or her followers did bury the treasure there, Ludlov granted. However, I'm less convinced that it is still there, or still accessible. With the crown of Kulmaron submerged, we might not be able to get it. A heavy chest full of gold and diamonds so deep under the sea? I'm less than optimistic, I have to admit. They ascended the steps to the deck. Ludlov saw that the sails were furled and the Teresia was slowly bobbing along in calm waters. At least the weather was on their side, he thought. Ah, there you are, came Chappelle's voice behind them. The captain wants to have breakfast with all of us, she said, and disappeared again below deck. Spirits were high at the breakfast table. Everyone was talking excitedly about the treasure. Even Captain Brokelhoff was in a decidedly more optimistic mood than the night before. Only the priestess was quiet and kept to herself. When Alvarado wanted to fill her plate, she held up her hand. At the start of our true peril, we will need all the help the goddess is willing to bestow upon us. Fasting will purify my prayers. Of course, blessed, Alvarado said politely, before sitting down next to Ludlow. Leaning close to him, he said, I'm happy I chose to become a witch hunter and not a priest. The celibacy I can handle, if barely, but all that fasting would really be too much. Tormgard, who was sitting on the opposite side, answered with a sardonic grin. You're not a witch hunter yet, Esclavian. It would surprise me if all of us made the trip back home. Don't assume you'll be among the fortunate ones. The initiate shrugged as he gobbled up a spoonful of broth. I trust in the goddess, not in fortune, he said. And she has already helped me, Ludlov and Gustav here to chase off this sea serpent. We'll see what comes next. Besides, if I do have to die, I'm certain the goddess will have a fitting death in mind. And from what I hear, for the honorable soul, the afterlife has more to offer than life on Hruda does. Finding his threatening words had been without effect, Tomgard's grin faded. I need all of your eyes today, the captain told everyone at the table, coming out of a conversation with von Baumeister. This may be a boring journey, because we don't know how far we have to travel. My men and I will see to it that we travel safely, but as the treasure hunters, 
you will need to be on the lookout for the crown of Kulmarum. Each of you will be given a spyglass. I made sure to buy them in Boneyard Bay. You may compensate my expense if and when you find the treasure. Stay focused at all times. At the slightest hint of anything that isn't water, we will steer the Teresia away and send you out in a rowboat to investigate. A few hours later, Ludlov was sitting in his usual spot on a crate on the deck, enjoying the warmth of the sun. He lowered the spyglass through which he had been peering for the past half hour. The day was bright and the sea still calm, but clouds were gathering on the horizon. So far, no one had seen anything out of the ordinary. <sighs> Sighing, he sat back putting the spyglass down next to him. He decided to take out his journal and write. It had been a while since he had last taken the time to do so. Flipping through the pages, he went over his early entries, when he had just joined the Witch Hunter Order. The writing had been terse, written in a sloppy, hasty hand. He smiled. It was clear his superiors had kept him too busy to mull over Maria's death. Reading some of his earlier writings again, he noticed how they contained little mention of his fellow initiates, or the other witch hunters aside from his teachers. He felt shame at that. He had been turned so inward that he had failed to engage with his peers. He raised his head and looked at Chapelle, Alvarado and Federhel on the other sides of the ship, realizing he had learned to care about other people again. Part of him was still aloof, still afraid of the cost of attachment, but he had taken his first steps out of his self-absorbed grief and was grateful for that. If they never found the treasure, the journey would at least have given him that. He looked at Alvarado, who was leaning over the opposite side of the ship, carefully watching the sea surface, eschewing the use of a spyglass. It looked like he was eating something. Then he noticed Chapelle on the quarterdeck behind the captain. She was kneeling and seemed to be cleaning the planks that had been nailed onto the wooden railing. The crew had put them there to reinforce and in places replace the railing where Chubalba had apparently bitten through or his acid had damaged it. As Chapelle's arm moved, he saw she'd just wiped away an excess drop of paint from a plank with a piece of cloth. Ludlov closed his journal, jumped off the crate, and made his way up the steps onto the quarterdeck, nodding a greeting at the captain in passing. As he approached, it became clear the young woman was actually painting a beautiful landscape on the planks. It was a field of flowers in front of a deep blue sea, with stars shining in the sky above it. The colors were absolutely stunning. You're just full of surprises, aren't you? he said to Chapelle. Turning from her work, she smiled modestly and said, It calms my nerves. Then there was a short silence, and she added, I thought the captain would appreciate it if I helped him to brighten up the ship a bit after it got battered by that snake. I do appreciate it, my dear, said the captain's voice from the steering wheel. He was still looking ahead. Chapelle's attention was focused on her painting once more, and Ludlov decided to leave her in her creative meditation. He turned and made his way down the steps again, walking towards Alvarado. He felt uneasy, and his mind was no longer set on writing. Alvarado gave Ludlov a playful salute and offered him an exotic piece of fruit, identical to the one he was still chewing on himself. It looked somewhat like a peach, but it was deep red on the outside and had soft yellow flesh on the inside. No thank you, Ludlov said, too nervous to eat all of a sudden. The two initiates watched the waves together in silence for a while. There was a certain peace in that, and Ludlov felt himself calming down again. His stomach began to rumble, and he regretted declining Alvarado's offer. The Esclavian must have heard it, because he wordlessly offered the fruit once more. Smiling, 
Ludlov accepted it gratefully and took a bite. The fruit was very sweet and tingled on his tongue. It had a strange aftertaste, unlike anything he had ever had before. Strange but wonderful, isn't it? said Alvarado. Yes, that's exactly what it is, said Ludlov. This is Mithakara, said Alvarado. A very popular fruit in Esclavia, and healthy too. Very good for the skin. That's why mine is so smooth. <laughs> Ludlov chuckled. Speaking of smooth skin, what is Chappelle doing up there? Alvarado asked. Haven't you taken a look? It's quite stunning, Ludlov said. I was watching the sea, as I was ordered, Ludlov. Alvarado replied with a wink. He threw the stone at the heart of the fruit into the water and wiped his hands on each other. Let's go take a look then, he said, and made for the quarterdeck. Ludlov took a look around. Federhel and Tormgard were still looking ahead with their spyglasses. Figuring it was safe to take his eyes off the water for a bit, he followed Alvarado for another look at Chappelle's work. When he arrived on the quarterdeck, he immediately recognized the new addition she was painting. The elegant flower, with a yellow heart hidden between soft, silver-purple petals, had been rendered quite faithfully. It was undeniably Maria's favorite flower. Maiden's Night Cloak. Well noticed, Initiate, Chappelle said, continuing her work without turning. I didn't know you were a connoisseur of flowers. I'm not, Ludlov admitted. I hadn't heard of that one. Can you eat it? Alvarado asked. No, Ludlov said, still captivated by the beauty of the painting. The taste is unbearably bitter, but the scent is... what I imagine the light of the stars might smell like, if you ever come across one. You will understand. Alvarado shrugged. So it's inedible. That's probably why I hadn't heard of it. You know, Alvarado, for a man of fine taste, you sound as coarse as a flatlander sometimes, Chappelle said. Where is Gustav, anyway? Ludlov wondered aloud. Mr. Finsterdunkel offered to man the crow's nest, said Captain Brokelhoff. I gave him the opportunity. He's very committed to his task. I do not doubt that, Ludlov replied. He has been extremely excited about the treasure hunt from the beginning. Why, I wonder, Alvarado said. Just what did Lord Adomir promise him if we find it? He's only after a single trinket, he claims, Chappelle said. And he's convinced it's part of the treasure. He's not willing to divulge anything more than that. Mr. Finsterdunkel is and remains a mystery, Ludlov muttered. As the day crept by, the clouds on the horizon got closer. Rather than rising up or dissipating, they remained hovering over the sea until the Teresia slowly sailed straight into a thick broil of grey mist. It became impossible to look ahead with their spyglasses, as their visibility was limited to less than a dozen yards. At this point, the captain became very nervous, clasping the steering wheel tightly. It felt like the ship was just resting in the water now, but they could still hit the crown unexpectedly at any moment. Ludlov was beginning to fear they had actually passed the notorious rock formation by now. You know, this whole endeavor might be for naught, said the captain, echoing Ludlov's quiet concerns. Perhaps the sea level has risen so much by this point that we've already sailed right over the crown. If you are right, Captain, then indeed we might as well return home, Chappelle admitted. But it's too soon to tell. Ludlov was sitting on his usual barrel again, looking at the others on deck. The crew was quietly going about their business, while the treasure hunters were all sitting around idly, looking nervous. He watched Alvarado beside him, once more in the middle of eating something. Apparently it was a piece of bread, some kind of garlic bread by the smell of it. All of a sudden, a white bird emerged out of the mist and soared down towards Alvarado's hand. 
Shoo! Away with you! cried the Esclavian, swatting the gull away, which responded with loud angry cries, but then fluttered out of sight again. Winged pirates! Alvarado grumbled, as Ludlov looked at him in shock. Why are you looking at me like that? The initiate asked, still grumpy about the gull's attempt to steal his food. Seagulls never stray this far from land, Alvarado, Ludlov said meaningfully. Alvarado quickly swallowed the piece of bread still in his mouth and pointed back into the fog with wide eyes. Do you mean that the crown is right here? Somewhere close at least. The bird flew starboard, said the captain. I assume it went back to its nest, so there has to be land in that direction. We will steer port side to stay clear. You witch hunters should row a boat in the opposite direction. I fully agree, Captain, said von Baumeister, scanning the deck with his eyes. This is Mr. Finsterdunkel's chance to prove his worth, he proclaimed loudly. He will be taking the key with him. What? Into that creepy mist? Ludlov heard Gustav mutter close by. He wondered when the Flatlander had come down from the crow's nest. Chappelle should also go, since she has already offered to be our diver, von Baumeister continued. Actually, our three initiates are required to join. Ludlov and the Esclavian may do the actual rowing. Ludlov sat in the middle of the boat next to Alvarado, facing the aft and rowing away from the Teresia. He turned around momentarily to cast a glance at Chappelle in the front of the boat, silhouetted by the light coming from a lion's head, carrying a lantern in its mouth that was artfully constructed on the inside of the prow. Ludlov turned back and continued his rowing. The lantern's glass had a green color, causing the light to land as a sickly glare on the figure of Gustav, who sat in the back of the boat facing them, holding the statuette closely. The lantern did little to penetrate the fog, however, which hovered silently on all sides, thick as the murky waters of the Grand Marshes, from what Ludlov had heard. It was like the grey shroud was a living entity, bent on hiding the crown from all who would come to seek it out. Ludlov and Alvarado could no longer see the Teresia at all. Listen, Chappelle hissed behind Ludlov's back. He and Alvarado stopped rowing and waited. Everyone was quiet for a bit. The water lapping against the hull of the rowboat, the only sound. Then, the cry of a gull broke the silence. It's not far, Chappelle said. Turn left just a bit, and then row onward. The two initiates obeyed, and the little boat changed direction. The gull's cry was joined by another, and soon the sound of the seabirds became a clear guide ahead. So they continued, slowly making their way across the water until it felt like the Teresia was nothing but a distant memory, and the whole world had shrunk down to the size of their modest vessel. Suddenly, the boat rocked as Gustav veered upright, appearing ghostly in the light of the lantern. There! he cried out. The crown of Kulmaron! Neither Ludlov nor Alvarado could resist the temptation to turn and look. It emerged out of the waters like the towers of an ancient castle hidden deep in a forest. Three of the five enormous peaks were clearly visible, towering out of the water like massive clawed fingers. Girls were flying to and fro, letting out their melancholy cries into the mist. It hasn't sunken beneath the waves at all. It has risen above them, Chappelle said in awe. <clears throat> How is that possible? Alvarado said with a grunt of exertion while rowing. Has the sea level gone down again? I don't know, Chappelle admitted. Perhaps we are in luck, 
Or perhaps the tales of it sinking beneath the waves were simply exaggerated. The rowboat entered the circle of five stones. Here we are in the city of five peaks, Gustav joked uncomfortably. Two more and we're back home. No one laughed. The bottom of the crown is still below the surface, so I will still have to dive, Chappelle said, looking at the water apprehensively. Are you sure I shouldn't do the honours? Federhel offered. After all, I'm expendable. No one here is more expendable than anyone else, Federhel, Chappelle countered. You are brave, but inexperienced. Besides, I used to dive for oyster pearls back in one vue. I have done this sort of thing before. Undoubtedly, your big blue eyes helped you see underwater as well, Alvarado said in a half jest. Ludlov was quiet, but he knew this was a very different situation compared to a carefree dive into clear waters on a sunny day. There was no telling how deep the bottom of the crown was, and the mist probably made it dark below the surface. Chapelle had entered the boat barefoot, without her hat, weapons or leather vest. Wearing only her buttoned shirt and dark breeches for modesty's sake, she was ready to jump into the water right away. She stood up and held out her hand to Gustav, who handed over the statuette very slowly. It's heavier than I thought, Chapelle said. As they had agreed, she took a long piece of rope that lay coiled in the boat and began to tie it to her waist, with the statuette tucked in snugly. She handed over the rope to Ludlov. You hold this. If anything suspicious seems to be happening, just pull me back up. Ludlov nodded and cast a worried glance in Alvarado's direction. That key hasn't left me since I bought it, Chapelle. Please bring it back, Gustav pleaded in a surprisingly vulnerable tone. Without it, I fear that von Baumeister will feed me to the sharks. Don't worry. If I survive... So will the key, she said. That's what I mean. Please don't die. Oh, and one more thing. The pudgy shopkeeper stuck his hand into one of his pockets and began searching for something awkwardly. Ah, yes, here it is. He pulled out a glass sphere, similar to the ammunition for the strange crossbow Rudloff had used against Tubalba, but smaller. There was a swirling green mist inside. I've no idea how this works, and it's probably some sort of magic, but it may help you. Chappelle frowned suspiciously. Magic? I'd rather not, thank you. Wait, Ludlov said. What does it do? Gustav shrugged. It casts light if you tap it hard enough. It might be enough to see the keyhole by. That would actually be very helpful, Federhel admitted reluctantly. Do your witch hunter rules say you cannot use magical items? Gustav asked. No, actually, Federhel replied. The codex says it's allowed under specific conditions. Would those conditions apply now? Gustav asked. Chappelle sighed. <sighs> they would, she said, accepting the small orb, looking at it with more fear than she had exhibited at the prospect of diving for the key. Just tap it very hard when you think you are near the bottom, Gustav said. It will give you light for, well, long enough to insert the key and turn it, I think. I hope. Maiden be with you, Chappelle, Ludlov said. Maiden, Maiden be, be with, with you. you, Alvarado and Federhel repeated. Thank you, initiates. But don't be afraid. As far as I know, there are no sharks in these waters. Chappelle said in a failed attempt at levity. Then she took a deep breath, stretched out her arms in front of her, and with a graceful swoop, she jumped into the water. She disappeared into the depths quickly, and soon the rope began to follow with a powerful tug, then quiet, followed by another tug, continuing in a slow rhythm. Ludlov held the rope in his hands, letting the coarse material slide through. With each tug, he felt his friend's descent into the darkness below. As the seconds passed, the tugs came more slowly, until the rope stopped moving altogether. 
She's at the bottom, I think, Federhel whispered. Rudloff began to worry. How long could this woman hold her breath? She didn't exactly look like she had very large lungs. Suddenly, the rope jerked into motion, like the sudden attack of a snake. Ludlov grabbed it tightly, but the pull became even stronger, causing the boat to rock. Alvarado stood up and helped Ludlov pull at the rope with all his might. The two men exerted all their strength until suddenly, whatever weight was at the other end came loose and they almost toppled over each other. What happened? Federhel asked, wide-eyed. No one responded. Ludlov began frantically hauling up the rope. He could still feel a small weight at the end of it. Everyone waited in silent tension until Ludlov would reach the end of the rope. Ludlov's heart sank below the waves, when out of the water came nothing but the statuette of Sintrasha, tied to the rope in a firm knot. The key! Gustav said in relief. But... What about... There! Alvarado hissed, pointing at a movement in the water a few paces ahead, accompanied by a soft green light. It was the glass sphere that rose to the surface and then lay bobbing on the gentle waves as the light slowly faded. Then the water moved a little further on. There was a strange bubbling foam followed by something rising to the surface and then floating on top of the water, just like the glass sphere had done. This time, it was a flat and brown object. What is that? Alvarado asked. Ludlov gave it little attention. It looks like just a piece of driftwood. The real question is, where is Chappelle? She couldn't possibly still be breathing on the water. They all stood staring at the impenetrable water, their hopes crushed. Ludlov felt a sickening sensation as he began to realize what had happened. Somehow, Chappelle had known she wouldn't make it back to the surface and had tied the statuette back to the knot so at least her companions would still have the key. She had made one final sacrifice before whatever lurked in these depths had taken her. She... she... Federhel stammered, unable to get the impossible words across his lips. Don't just stand there, you idiots! A voice came from behind them. They all turned around. Ludlov's heart skipped a beat when he saw Chappelle swimming towards them. Her wet, darkened hair stuck to her face and she had a frantic expression as she swam as fast as she could towards the rowboat. You're alive! Federhel cried out. The woods! Get the woods! She yelled. Ludlov turned around again, looking for the piece of driftwood they had seen earlier. It was out of sight. Where is the woods? Chappelle cried out again, as she grabbed hold of the rowboat. It came out of the water over there, Alvarado replied. But why do you think... Get it! Ludlov pulled off his boots as fast as he could. He wondered why he had even been wearing them. Then he jumped into the water. It was cold at first, but he quickly got used to it, especially when his body warmed up from the exertion of swimming to the center between the five peaks of the crown. Once there, he could see nothing but the stone peaks and the rowboat. He turned, watching Alvarado and Federhel rowing towards him, Chappelle in the back with Gustav. The waves are moving that way, Federhel yelled, pointing to Ludlov's left. It must have drifted over there. Ludlov understood and immediately began swimming as fast as he could in the appointed direction. In his haste, he had failed to take off his leather jerkin and he could feel his clothes weighing him down as he swam. It felt like wading through a thick swamp. After crawling some distance through the water, he took the time to look ahead again, but he only saw little waves lapping up to the grey peaks. Then his eye caught a glimpse of something small and brown, swaying nervously against one of the rocks. There! He cried out, and swam towards the rock formation with the most powerful strokes he could manage. 
His arms and legs ached and his lungs felt like they were on fire when he arrived at the peak. The movement of the water had pulled the piece of wood loose and it now lay on the surface, floating out into the open sea ahead. Oh no you won't, Ludlove grunted, before taking a deep breath and continuing his frantic swim. If he hadn't been wearing so many clothes, he could have easily caught it, he realized, cursing himself for his lack of forethought. The piece of wood was close now, just out of his reach. With a final agonizing effort, he made his way towards it in a movement that could barely be called swimming anymore. He found himself submerged and swallowing a mouthful of cold, salty water. Rising to the surface, he coughed and spluttered about until his hand by chance grabbed hold of the piece of wood. He held on to it as if his life depended on it. Not bothering to even look at the thing, or wondering why it was important, he held it up. I've got it! The rowboat emerged out of the mist and Ludlov saw Chappelle's excited expression. To his relief, his companions hadn't noticed his less than heroic display of swimming. Alvarado stretched out his hand to him. Ludlov clasped it gratefully and was hauled on board. Thank you for listening to the fifth episode already of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay, a witch hunter tale. We wouldn't be able to keep releasing these audio projects and improving them with each release if it weren't for these wonderful patrons. The ones mentioned in the end credits are the patrons from the Witch Hunter tier or $5 tier and higher. Amy and Dallas Austin, Matt Petain, Peter Strandkrone, Cameron Brandley, Joseph Stahl, Cody Heitsch, Mix and Match, Arno Teva, Caitlin Bredenkamp, Kat Mosseri, Ryan Stock, Tony Ranico, and Liam Gabriel. If you enjoyed this episode and look forward to more of them, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on that notification bell so you'll get notified of our future uploads. Or consider activating the RSS feed on Podbean. Please share our stories with your fantasy-loving friends and relatives. And it's always encouraging for us to read your thoughts and feedback in the comments. Should you mention spoilers to those who haven't listened to the entire story yet, please write spoiler alert before your comment. Or keep that discussion for the appropriate channel on Discord. You can find the link to join our server in the description. The next chapter is called The Castaway and will be premiered next week. If those seven days weigh too heavily on your patience, you can consider purchasing the entire story on Bandcamp or join us on Patreon to get hold of the extended edition of this story, which makes this 14 and a half hour epic longer by 50 minutes. The extended edition contains some additional scenes that are overall a bit darker in tone or expand some of the existing scenes. It also adds more details about some of the characters' backgrounds, like Ludlov and Chappelle's, and the lore of the setting. And finally, it provides more action and drama and even contains a surprise epilogue that will grab fans of Witch Hunter in particular, but might also slightly spoil some of the shocking revelations in Witch Hunter. Check out our Patreon page and consider supporting us from as little as $1 a month, that would be a mere $12 a year. It would mean the world to us or at least buy us a pocket novel in a creepy dusty bookshop to inspire our next story. Thank you for listening to The Treasure of Boneyard Bay, and we hope you'll return next week for episode 6. As usual, we'll be hanging out in our YouTube chatroom lounge a couple of minutes before and after and also during the premiere on YouTube. Until then... <laughs>